Well, hello, everyone. When something really bad has happened to you, been done to you, or you've said something really bad against someone else, and it upsets them, or something's been done to upset you, what does Jesus say you and I should do? Someone has upset us, or we have upset them. By upset, I mean even sinned against. Or if you're handed a slice of really juicy gossip or news of what someone else has done to you or others, what's the right response? So hello everyone, I'm Philip Shields, host and founder of Light on the Rock, where we have over 400, almost 500 audio and video sermons now. Please be aware of that. Use the share, I mean the, uh, the search bar in the top right corner and put in a word or two of a topic you might be interested in. Um, and also, we, we show right on the home page, if you scroll down a bit, how to find the list of all the sermons and all the audios and all the videos. So make sure you're doing that because there's so much on here, so many hundreds of blogs and topics. Blogs are short articles. So this topic is actually a huge topic that needs to be learned and practiced in the church far, far more than it often is often not practiced at all. And even with the ones I'm working in Kenya and Tanzania, uh, it, it's just not being practiced. So it's go that's going to change. We're going to start practicing this. It's about handling times when we have caused offense or when someone has offended us, both ways. We must not, we must not just try to ignore and forget these situations. There's a procedure our master, Yeshua, Jesus, tells us to follow in each case. I believe very few brethren actually are following it. <clears throat> I've come to realize where I myself have had to reevaluate what I do and what I've done in the past, and I find myself repeating this process in Matthew 18 in so many situations where sin occurred or where people were offended by a brother or sister. It's very important to the living God that we're all getting along, that we all love one another, that we all resolve conflicts. God, as our Father, doesn't like his children being in conflict and being offended, causing it or receiving it. The first one is where a brother, the first one we're going to talk about is where the, a brother in the body of Christ has sinned against you. He feels um, where a brother in the body has sinned against you, right? Um, no, the first one we're going to talk about is where you have done something that you realize has offended the other person. Okay? The first one is where we have done something to offend the other person. He feels you offended him. So here are the clear instructions. Matthew 5. Let's start with that one. Matthew 5, 23 and 24 in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 23, 24. <clears throat> Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, you've offended them, okay? You're bringing a gift to the altar. Now, we don't offer gifts and sacrifices to altars anymore. There's no temple anymore, that we, a physical temple. Uh, we don't offer animals anymore. But let's say you're preparing a tithe or something like that. And there you remember your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother. First. And then come and finish praying. And then come and offer your gift. God's saying don't even do religious things. Maybe you're getting your tithes ready to mail or preparing to fast for someone's healing. God is saying, hey, God is saying, your gifts don't impress me until you take care of the problem. Someone's upset with you. God doesn't want us leaving that all alone or thinking it's unimportant or that it'll go away on its own. To God, it's very important. Go fix the relationship. Make amends. If you can, sometimes people don't let you. Some people don't let us repair strained relationships. But if we pray hard about it and practice everything I'm going to show you in this talk today and the examples used by others in the Bible, I think we'll see just how people, in fact, were able to resolve conflicts. Even Jesus, who was offended, uh, I mean, who 
by everybody everybody sinned against Jesus when they abandoned him and denied him and all those things and even what Jesus did so anyway when we go to that person that we've offended if they're angry have a soft approach as you seek peace we read this in Proverbs 15 verse 1 a soft answer turns away anger turns away wrath a soft answer but a harsh word stirs up anger so if you start getting into a big argument over something you're trying to work out that's not gonna help at all soft answer how can we truly love one another when one is really upset with the other one we just can't leave it or claim that's their problem no we have to go find out what's upset them or what we did recount it listen intently make sure you understand what why they're so upset make sure you understand what they say you did or said that offended them here's a, st a sentence that I think is very important uh, Steve Cubby uh, has this in his book I forget the title of the book now but seek first to understand before you seek to be understood seek first to understand before you seek to be understood that is so wise that is so wise so when uh, you say okay tell me exactly how you feel about what I did I want to make sure I get the whole story from you listen listen quietly and then repeat it back to the person in different words in your words and then you say is that pretty much the way it is the way you see it did I am I understanding it correctly okay now you can speak and one of the first things you want to say is you're sorry you don't want to be talking a lot justifying yourself let the offended person do most of the talking even a fool is considered wise when he remains silent Proverbs 10 19 Proverbs 10 19 and the multitude of words sin is not lacking sin is not lacking when someone's gabbing a lot especially in conflict sin is right there he who restrains his lips is wise even a fool will be considered wise if he restrains his lips many of us instead of really listening about why and how we offended someone we start immediately explaining how the offended ones got it all wrong that's not what we're told be willing instead to humble yourself and be willing to esteem the others better than higher than yourself I'm gonna give a sermon on that soon too because it really is hard if we're honest for many of us at many times to esteem someone better than yourself so therefore you don't and boy that's really bad if you don't follow this verse many of you can't seem to do it um, anyway apologize from the heart but we carnally will tend to justify ourselves instead we all do it I've done it pastors do it brethren do it stop let's read Philippians 2 verse 3 so many too many times we find it so hard to say the powerful words I'm sorry that starts with lowliness of mind with humility be watching for my sermon on esteeming others better than yourself um, let nothing be done Philippians 2 3 let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself but so many times we try instead to explain you misunderstood me I had pure intentions but this is very self-righteous self-justifying approach that's not going to help heal the situation and if you don't watch it you'll just make matters worse with everybody especially with God especially with God so apologize from the heart apologize for the hurt feelings and ask what you can do to make everything right if money or some kind of recompense is necessary do it the best you can or promise to do it if you don't have it right then and there do everything in your power to help the other person to no longer be upset with you if you can sometimes you can't but do your best pray about it 
So Matthew 5 is about when you remember someone else is offended by you. Matthew 5, verses 23 to 24. Now, an excellent example of someone who was highly offended to the point where he wanted to kill his brother was Esau and Jacob. Jacob did a wonderful thing when he tried to restore the relationship. I want you to read it on your own in Genesis 32 and 33. An excellent example. Jacob was going back home to his father, Abraham, after grossly offending his brother Esau, who wanted to kill Jacob for stealing his birthright and his blessing. So he ran away, Jacob did, far away. God would have worked it all out and given Jacob the birthright and the blessing had he trusted God, but he and his mother Rebekah couldn't wait uh, for God to work things out, so they sinned. And as a result, I don't believe Jacob ever saw his mother alive again, or that Rebekah ever saw Jacob or the grandchildren ever again. So read the story of how Jacob humbled himself, how he sent large gifts for Esau, who had stated he wanted to kill Jacob. It's, he, Jacob did this before meeting Esau. That's all in Genesis 32, verses 9 to 21. I'm sure God softened Esau's heart too, partly by sending, I'm sure, visible angels. Genesis 32, 1 and 2 talk about Genesis 32, verses 1 and 2 talk about angels that even Jacob could see, many of them. So I'm sure God sent these angels even in front of Esau, in front of Jacob to Esau. So basically the message was, don't mess with my servant Jacob, okay, who is now going to be called Israel, as you'll see in Genesis 32. But Esau was coming with 400 men to kill Jacob. So his heart had to be softened. So God sent angels, God softened his heart, Jacob sent gifts. And then the story of the meeting is actually in Genesis 33. Please read that. Take the time to read it. See how Jacob and everyone in his family bowed way down in humility to Esau and gave him a huge gift. Jacob did not try to justify himself, did not say, oh, you didn't value the birthright anyway. You were willing to sell for a bowl of lentil soup. Come on. What was I to do? No, he didn't justify where he could have, but he just didn't. Why he stole that birthright and the blessing. He just humbled himself, left the huge gift, made peace. Will some of you please listen to this? You justify yourselves. A great pattern for us to follow when we go to someone we know we have offended. Now, pause the audio for a minute and ponder who is upset with you right now that you know about. Write down quickly. Then determine to obey God, the Son of God, to obey the Son of God and, and, and with His help to fix it. Don't let it fester like a bad sore. It just gets worse and worse. So that's when someone is someone you've offended. You've offended them. But what about when a brother sins against you? Now that's in Matthew 18. I'm going to talk about that for the rest of the sermon here. Matthew 18, verses 15 to 17. Matthew 18, 15 to 17. Please read it in your Bible. Really learn this verse. Matthew 18, 15. I'm going to keep mentioning it to the people in Kenya and Tanzania and anywhere where I help pastor that we learn this, and I've got to learn it. We've all got to learn it. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, okay, you're the one offended now. You've been sinned against. Go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Alone. But do something about it. And if he hears you, you've gained your brother. If he will not hear, take with you one or two more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. If he refuses to hear them, the witnesses, then tell it to the church, the ecclesia. But if he refuses to even hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen, a tax collector, someone not in the church. 
So, but what are some of the typical carnal reactions when someone hurts us? Okay, they've sinned against me, against you. We gossip. That is a terrible sin. So they sinned against us, and now we sinned against them by gossiping. We tell others about what was said or done to us, especially if the other person hurt us badly. But if we do this, we're gossiping, we become sinners ourselves against them by our gossip. We might even immediately call the pastor at the same time and feel all righteous because we're going to talk to the pastor first. That's not what the Bible says to do. Some get very effective at spreading gossip, especially with modern social media, internet. Within seconds, a matter can go all around the world, and we become a human manure spreader, spreading gossip like manure to everyone we can wrong approach. Or some who are familiar with Matthew 18 verses 15 to 17 may try to look like they're doing the right thing by uh, going to the person who caused offense, but we immediately take some witnesses or friends with us whom we claim will be impartial. But they're ones we're taking. This, appro this approach breaks the process told us by Jesus Christ, by Yeshua. What we're supposed to do is so hard. It is hard. Sometimes the one who causes a sin or offense may not even want to meet with you. And you'll have to assure them that you need to talk. We'll be very private and quiet. They know you're mad at them. But tell them I want to resolve things. In the beginning, keep this one-on-one, -on -one, one person, no witnesses, to bolster your position. None. Let's read it again directly from the mouth of the Son of God. If your brother sins against you, you go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If you've gained him, if, you, if he hears you, you've gained your brother back. Now, so the first meeting or discussion is just between the offender, that's the other guy, and the offended one, which is you. You and he alone, no one else except God in prayer. Yes, definitely pray about it. Pray that God keep you gentle and humble and seeking peace. Yes, I'm preaching to myself right here too. As I've not followed this perfectly at all either. As I see, I need this so much too. We all do. So we don't talk about it ahead of time with anybody else, not even the pastor, anyone else, by telephone, by email. You're disobeying Jesus, the Son of God, if you share this juicy gossipy tidbit with anybody else. This has to be just two people trying to iron out some offense, some sin, privately, alone, quietly. The alone part is perhaps the hardest part to obey, but we've got to obey it. We must learn to follow instructions, to obey God's words. These words directly come from the living word of God, Jesus Christ. So if we're not following this, we are not to tell our wife, what the other brother did or sinned against you. You are not to tell your husband. Admit it, it's hard, isn't it? You don't first tell your spouse. You don't first tell anybody in the family, your friends, your neighbors, or anyone else in the church. You don't even first tell your pastor, even though too many of us do so. But we do so under the pretense of, Pastor, I just want to make sure I'm doing this right. Then I'm going to go talk to so-and-so because I know I'm supposed to go to my brother. No, if you talk to the pastor first, you've just broken the instruction. We're disobeying Jesus. If we don't go and talk to our brother who sinned against us alone first. It says we're to go and tell him his fault. No one else. Alone. So neither should we, of course, even think of putting any of this on social media or letters or notes, emails. Just go and talk to the offender. Tell him or her alone first. No one else. Keep saying it because this is the hardest part to do. This alone task seems to be the hardest part. Anyway, 
this is so hard. But if God's Spirit is present in you, we hope, and in the other, and the other one as well, the result should be peace. The wrath of man does not result in peace or righteousness. So we can't go angry. We can't go angry. Look at James 1, verses 19 and 20. We must not go angry. James 1, 19 and 20. So then, my beloved brethren, when every man, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak. It's often said we're, God gave us two ears and one mouth as a sign. Be twice as willing to listen than to speak. I speak to myself too. I love to speak. We've got to learn. Swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Now, if the other person doesn't admit the sin or doesn't quit justifying themselves, yeah, I get angry too. God says, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Now, on the other hand, God himself got angry many, many times when people said, uh, refused to acknowledge their sins. So there is a righteous anger as well, the Bible speaks of. Okay. But anyway, hopefully your one-on-one -on -one meeting will solve the problem. Apology is accepted. Peace ensues. Don't bring up the sin again if there's been repentance. Leave a blessing for the one you're forgiving, as God does to us when we repent. I think it's in Joel 2. Go back, make a note to look at Joel 2. And you'll see what I'm talking about there. In Joel 2. When we repent before God, as God calls us to repentance in Joel 2, he not only forgives, he also blesses us in so many ways. Go back, go back and read all of Joel 2. The first part of Joel, he's calling us to repent, stop what we're doing, go repent before him. And then the last half of Joel 2, it says, and if you repent, I will restore the years the locust has eaten. I will bless you. I will cause rain and, and, and great production and wheat and everything else um, go back and read it if we repent God blesses us so always be ready with a blessing as well what if the person does it again same thing sins against you offends you again and again and again you'll probably be told by someone maybe even your pastor or you'll decide on your own that that behavior just means that person can't really have repented but here's what our Savior who has had to repent you and me over and over and over and over again over the years right we all repent we all have to keep asking for forgiveness and God has to keep forgiving us sometimes of the very same thing maybe it's Sabbath breaking maybe it's lust maybe it's covetousness maybe it's being dissatisfied Luke 17, verse 3 and 4. Luke 17, verses 3 and 4. Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day. I can't even imagine that. You've forgiven somebody then six more times that same day. He comes back and says, I did it again. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I gossiped about you again. Or I did that horrible thing again against you. Or I committed adultery again. <laughs> if he sins against you seven times in a day. Can you grasp that? And seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent. You must forgive him. You shall forgive him. And even if he does it seven times in a single day and says he's sorry and repent, that you shall forgive him. And then in Matthew 18, verses 21 and 22, Jesus says 70 times seven, seven zero times seven, forgive him. That's an expression meaning don't ever stop forgiving. It doesn't mean 490. It means for forever and ever, never stop. It's an expression of this is 
something that will just keep on going. Don't even stop after seven times. Not forgiving him would just make us bitter. We become like a container holding a very toxic chemical, powerful chemical, that's going to end up just destroying the container. The container's me. The container's you. You and I are that container. Forgive and leave the judgment to God to handle. Remember, if you don't forgive anyone for anything, any sin, then you're setting the standard for your own judgment by God. God says, by what measure you use, the standard you use, will be used against you. If we're tough on forgiving, God will be tough on forgiving us too. If we don't forgive others their sin, God won't forgive us either. And God also in that passage says, how dare you go and be upset with somebody else about a little splinter in their eye when you've got a whole two-by-four in your eye? You've got a plank in your eye. It's that serious. I say forgive them even if they don't fully repent in your view. Let God be their judge. Forgive them even if they don't fully repent in your view. Let God be their judge. Did Jesus wait to forgive others only after they'd repented while he was there on the cross? No, they were spitting on him and cursing him, taunting him. What did he say even with the people spitting and doing all those things and cursing him and the pain that he was suffering as they tried to slowly kill him? They weren't repenting. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Father, forgive them. Luke 23, 34. Had they repented when he said this? No. He said it anyway. In, in the Lord's Prayer, right after the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, okay? Matthew 6, verse 14 and 15, he goes on to say, Matthew 6, verses 14 and 15, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive men their trespasses, the way they've sinned against you, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. Now, trespass is a more serious kind of a sin. Jesus, Yeshua, gave us further instructions. If the problem is not solved in the first round of events, you went to your brother and it just got worse. It wasn't resolved. He didn't apologize. You're still offended. You're still sinned against. At that point, you can take one or two others who will be seen as fair, in your view at least, to be your witnesses. That's when you take others. That's Matthew 18, 16. Then if even that doesn't work, at that point you take it to the church. Possibly at this point get the pastor involved as the one coordinating the church, the flock. It will then be up to the pastor. If he wants to keep the offending brother as part of the flock, or put him out for not making peace. In the meantime, forgive from the heart no matter what happens. We must forgive from the heart like Jesus did even before they repented. Don't just wait for repentance. Love from the heart. Pray for those who hurt you, who've sinned against you. Bless those who curse you, Jesus said. If you're having a tough time forgiving, ask God to help you get there. We need God's love for others to be able to forgive bad things they did to us. And realize just how much you've been forgiven, and I've been forgiven by God. There's a story in Luke 7. I don't have it in my notes, but I think it's Luke 7, where this woman... Uh, Jesus is reclining at dinner with the Pharisee who invited him there. And while he's there, this known sinner, maybe a prostitute, came in and started crying and washing Jesus' feet with her tears, wiping them off with her hair. In fact, let's, let's go there and read it. Luke 7. I really identify with this because I feel I've had a lot to be forgiven. Uh, the end of Luke 7, I'll just pick up the story where Jesus knew they were criticizing him for letting her do all these things. 
and that uh, they thought if this man were really a prophet, Luke 7, verse 39, he would know who this woman was. So Jesus told the story. And then he says to him here in verse 43, Simon answered, I suppose the one who forgave more will love more. Jesus said to him, you've rightly judged. Luke 7, verse 44 now. Luke 7. Hang on, let me write this down. So I can add it to my notes. Verse 44. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? See her. I know she's here in my house. I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she's washed my feet with her tears, wiped them off with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You didn't anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to her, her sins, yeah, there are lots of sins, which are many. Her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. I love this sentence, for to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Or you can say, to whom much is forgiven, the same loves much. I think I really, really, really love Jesus. Speak often of him, because I realize how much he's forgiven me. And then he turned to her and said, your sins are forgiven. Anyway, brethren, we've got to forgive those who have sinned against us. Our work is cut out for us. Let's obey our master. Practice this very difficult new covenant teaching by Yeshua, by Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. Let's not be that second man. By second man, I mean don't be the guy who loves telling others all about someone else and why they sin so badly against you. Don't be like that. Why they shouldn't be coming to church. That, that other person is a slanderer. Whoever does the gossiping is a slanderer. If you might be that person. You might end up slandering him because they did something against you and now you're slandering them. Now we're the ones sinning. Do you know what devil means? It means slanderer. Devil means slander. So when we slander, especially a brother or sister in the church, child of God, we have become a devil by definition. We have become a slanderer. When you slander, you become someone employed by the adversary to slander someone else. Satan means adversary. The devil means a slanderer. That's how he is our enemy. He slanders us. Remember, love doesn't keep record of wrongs. Love doesn't want to remember this. Love doesn't want to keep mulling it over. I've been guilty of that. Or I keep mulling over my own sins, or sometimes sins of others against me. And we figure out what will we say, and how will we prove that we're right, and how will we justify that we were right to say what we did, and do what we did, instead of just letting it go. So let's read 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 to 7 in the NIV. This is the love chapter. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 7. The love chapter. Try to stop mulling over the offenses others have done against you, or even your own. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 to 7. Love is patient. Love is kind. If you're ever doing something, I'm doing something that's not kind, that's not loving. It does not envy does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It, love, is not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Keeps no record of wrongs. If you can find a place where you've written down dates and times and what was said and who was there, you're breaking God's law here. It keeps no record of wrong. Love does not delight in evil. We don't want to talk about it, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always trusts. Try your best to always trust the brother. Even when you feel they're not telling the entire truth. Come from a motive of, I'm going to trust you. Always hopes, always perseveres. 
Let's read that again. This time, instead of saying love or it, let's put my name, your name. Read it with your name. Love, Philip, your name, is patient. Philip is kind. Philip doesn't envy. I'm not always kind. i got to work on that. Philip is, does not boast. Philip is not proud. Sometimes I am, but I'm just saying put your name in there. I'm going to change the name to, um, I don't know, let's pick another name. Um, let's, let's, let's use the name uh, Frank. Okay, I'm not thinking of any Franks right now. Frank is not rude. Frank is not self-seeking. Frank is not easily angered. Frank keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Frank always protects. Frank always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Wow. That really makes you see, I hope it does, yourself and where you got to grow and overcome more. So peace. Be a peacemaker. Even if you don't feel you've got your full opportunity to vent and release all your anger because someone has sinned against you. Be a peacemaker. It's the peacemakers who are called the children of God. The sons of God. Matthew 5 verses 5 to 9 in the Beatitudes. Matthew 5 verses 5 to 9. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. They! Only the meek will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they, I want to say only they, according to other scriptures, will receive mercy. Blessed are the merciful, be merciful to the one who has really hurt you. They shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, they shall be called, only they shall be called children, sons of God. So my point today was to really focus, be really focused on the uh, sequence. Start small. Talk to the perceived offender first. Only him or her. Nobody else. So we don't gossip about it. Do so alone, all by yourself, privately. No one else should be around. If it's about a man, you don't have his wife there as well. Just talk to just the man. Do it alone. After all, that's the way you'd like to be treated, isn't it? You would like the opportunity to resolve an offense or to repent of a sin when only one person has to know about it. Wouldn't you like that as well if you were the one who had sinned? The second greatest commandment, after all, is love your neighbor as you love yourself. So Matthew 18, verses 15 to 17, gives us good guidelines on how to love our neighbor when things have gone really badly for them and to us. It's wise. It's the right thing to do, and it works. But it works only if we practice it carefully. Sometimes it has to go to the next stages of verses 16 and 17 and bring witnesses or tell the pastor, but not, not first. But Matthew 18, this is the way we're told to handle disputes and to work out offenses. God bless you. Father in heaven, we come before you. We just ask you that you will help us to really apply this passage. It's so hard to not gossip when we're offended. It's so hard to forgive when we've really been badly hurt. It's so hard to keep it alone, private. We want to just spew it all out there and let everybody know how bad that other person was. Help us to grow in this and to love you and be more like your son, Jesus Christ, and the more like you. But Yeshua, Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah on the, on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Help us to have that attitude too and help us to reconcile. Help us to practice going to our brother first and alone and nobody else with an attitude of forgiveness, with an attitude of esteeming them better better than we are. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Yeshua. Thank you, Jesus. In your mighty holy name. Amen.